it's our last topic on um, low temperature geochemistry. So we, I don't wanna have any spillover. So I'm gonna, for the purposes of the video, I'm just gonna keep going till the end, even if you guys have to leave. Hopefully if I go over by a few minutes, I just that way it's continuous. Um, but we're talking about climate change today. And we're gonna focus on the chemical aspects of it. And, um, you know, it builds on the conversation we were having last. So, right, if you remember back to two times ago, we talked about stable isotopes. And especially from the what we call paleo proxy perspective, kind of reconstructing water volumes and um, looking at isotopic fractionation as a function of temperature and all those impacts on the hydrologic cycle. Then last time on Tuesday, we talked about paleoclimate records, isotopic and others. And this is all the kind of story that has been developing, I would say, since the 50s, 50s, 60s, 70s. People understood a lot about climate, not everything, but a lot about how climate varied in the past on Earth and what records it left and didn't leave. And I would say that's around the time, by 1980, is the time when most geochemists, especially geochemists who were working on this topic, as well as like, you know, paleoceanographers and paleontologists understood the impacts of climate change from an anthropogenic sense, at least in the broadest perspective. And since then, all we've been doing is refining our understanding and trying to convince everyone else that, that it's been happening. And of course, now we see it all around us. But the, what I want to kind of do today is instead is talk about kind of the, um, the data, the evidence, the chemical controls on why the climate is changing, how complicated it is, um, how nonlinear it is, and some, some of what, you know, are the predictions that come out every few years from these IPCC reports. So uh, we've already kind of talked about now that the quaternary period, um, especially the last half of it, has seen a very periodic rise and fall of atmospheric gases along with the cycle of glacial and interglacial cycles, and that the gas content enhances the orbital force, right? So the orbital forcing is already happening. It's been happening since time immemorial, but only certain configurations of the planet, such as the current configuration with the continents and so forth, are sensitive to this forcing. So we haven't always had glacial and glacial cycles, but especially for the last couple of million years, we've had these cycles. They've changed in cyclicity about a million years ago. And, um, and we kind of know the responses of the planet. We know how gases go up and down. We look in ice cores and so forth. We know temperature records. And not every ice age and every interglacial is the same, but we have a pretty good idea of what it is. And so now you introduce humans, right? And so we're changing some stuff, especially atmospheric gases. And there's some debate about when this started. I mean, most, the initial conversation was always based around, uh, at least for the last several decades, the start of the industrial revolution, right? When we started, you know, mechanizing and using fuel at much higher rates. But in fact, and I'll point this out as we go on, humans have been doing stuff to affect the climate for much longer than, right? Just think about when we first started um, using fire and then when we started agriculture and various practices that also changed the gases. So it's important to kind of remember it's a function of scale, like how much are we doing that? How much are we doing that compared to the natural things? And so, the, in essence, I think everyone knows this now that the human forcing of gases has gotten to the point where this natural forcing has been overwhelmed by human activities over very, very short periods of time, taking the planet out of a very, um, you know, into a non equilibrium condition. And so, this is part of what makes it hard to predict how exactly it's going to respond because these changes happened on geological time scales. And so, you know, giving the planet time to, um, to reconstruct. So the data that we have, and we'll talk about a little bit of the accumulation rates of greenhouse gases since the start of the Industrial Revolution, as well as before that, and other things we have done, land use practices, putting soot into the atmosphere, that kind of stuff that also affects the climate. And then our predictions, right? And these predictions, you know, you hear about them, you're now seeing some of them come true. But I kind of want to emphasize that most of this is based on models. And models make predictions, not data. Many times people treat model output as data. It isn't. Um, 
models try to give us guidance about how various conditions and scenarios might impact the environment. It doesn't even have to, to be just climate models, all sorts of models. And we can treat the information that they give us like data, but they aren't data. It's important to, to remember that. But models have gotten to the point now, especially with the advent of supercomputing and very, very sophisticated multi-dimensional models that um, we can reproduce what we've seen in the past very, very accurately, which gives us confidence in our ability to project forward. But we also now have records over the last several decades of people making predictions and waiting five years to see how good their predictions were. And what I'll tell you is that scientists in general tend to be pretty conservative. And so while the predictions say, well, here's a range of possibilities, what ends up going into the kind of globally circulated reports, these IPCC reports, are usually the most conservative predictions. And time and time again, we find when we look back retrospectively that we're being too conservative. That our models actually predict what has happened, but what goes out in these reports, uh, you know, such and such is going to change with temperature or sea level or glacial melting or whatever, um, is less than it's actually been observed. Okay, so this is a record of carbon dioxide concentration starting in 1860. You know, both you remember like Eli Whitney and the cotton gin or whatever. People talk about the start of the Industrial Revolution, something like 1785, 1790, or whatever. But when you look at the use of carbon-based fuels, coal especially, then kind of transitioning to oil and then natural gas. The mid 1800s is when it really starts to kick in. And, and so, you know, you can make these plots from wherever you want, but um, this is fossil fuel production rate. Okay, these are records from the petroleum industry that have been accumulated. And assuming that 100% of that CO2 is burned, or excuse me, that carbon is burned to make CO2, this is the amount of carbon that makes in gigatons. Right, just out of a reference, just so you know, the annual output of the United States right now is about 5.5 per year, right? And that's less than half of the total global on the planet. And, um, and so this is a log scale, right? This has been increasing. It's continued to increase. And we'll look at some, some more recent plots, but this is sort of a, a retrospective plot looking back over you know, a significant period of time leading throughout the 20th century. And you know there was a flattening in here, you know, having to do with global economic uh, stuff like the Great Depression, etc. But it's it's in general it's been rising, right? And this is something that was actually known in the 40s and 50s. So the guy named Roger Revelle, he what he you know he maybe wasn't the first person to propose this, but he was probably the most prominent and proposed it in the most dramatic way that people could observe. Like I say, this was like World War II period of time that this amount of fossil fuel burning was going to change the atmosphere and was going to impact global climate. And to be honest, you know, by the time I learned about this stuff in the 80s, this was settled science. There wasn't any like, oh, well, is it going to happen or is it not going to happen? And so there's been this disparity between what, you know, the public knows, what the public accepts, what our politicians accept, etc. So starting in the very early 60s, there's a, a guy who named Charles Keeling, who was a student at Caltech. He graduated, he went down to Scripps and um, you know, suggested to him by that guy, Ravel, um, hey, you know, you should start measuring CO2 in the atmosphere and see what happens. And so he set this up as an early career junior professor. And what he started measuring was, was this up and down with, and this is seasonality in the carbon cycle, right? Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere, changes in solubility, in seawater, changes in with temperature, changes in production and consumption from the photosynthesis and respiration cycle. And so you can imagine, and he was probably pretty depressed, he's measuring it for years and years and years. And he's like, I don't know, it's just going up and down. I'm not seeing much, but he persisted. This is one of the most famous time series records in all of geochemistry, perhaps all of earth science, because eventually what he was able to see is that even though it was wiggling up and down, the mean, which is what the blue curve is, is going up. Right. And so, of course, when we're thinking about the atmosphere in any given year, we like to compare the same month. Right. And so that's usually done early in the year. That's when it reaches its peak at Mauna Loa. It's different in different places, but Mauna Loa is the longest continuous record. And when I checked earlier this year, we're up to 419 parts per million. OK. And this this here is about something like 315 at the 
start of the Industrial Revolution, meaning back in the late 1700s, it was about 283. Okay, so we haven't doubled it, but we're, we're certainly on the pathway. And that's just, you know, in a little more than 200 years. And you can go to this site if you want to. I mean, there are other sites too, but this one happens to be pretty good. It's like, you can plot out various things. So that's why I've given you the URL here about what the concentration of CO2 is in the atmosphere. And you can see how it changes year to year by measuring the same month. You can pick whatever month you want, et cetera, et cetera. It's going up, no signs of going down. And in fact, no signs of even flattening in this slope, right? It's going up as far, if you do a differential on this thing, you'll see that the slope is ever increasing, which matches the production rate. So then you say, well, how do we get from that to further in the past? We talked about ice cores already as our proxy record of the oxygen and hydrogen isotopic composition of water from the atmosphere that's being deposited on the land. Another thing that we can look at in ice are gases that were bubbles when the ice formed and then get compacted and dissolved in. In fact, this was one of my early jobs as a grad student was to take ice cores from Greenland and go into a cold room all day and take pieces of core and kind of scrape them and clean them and cut off all the melted part, stick them in a big chamber and melt them. And then we would measure the gases coming out. So these dots are um, uh, records that come out of ice cores, okay? And um, these records, this is direct measurement, right? And this is reconstructed measurement. And you can take these measurements further back Right? Well, we can look at constructions that go further back, but the key point is, is that this is sort of starting at the start of the Industrial Revolution and looking at what is trapped in those bubbles, what it means about the atmosphere in direct response to this kind of increase. Right, And before that, there were changes, but the changes were slow and on geological time scale. Okay? So it's not just CO2. There are other atmospheric gases as well that contribute to greenhouse warming. We talked about this last time that there's this atmospheric window, there are certain wavelengths where the natural gases in the atmosphere don't absorb that much, right? And so light transmits through that region and various gases that we are adding to the atmosphere are filling in that window, meaning that it absorbs more heat. And so from the perspective of carbon dioxide, there's a big CO2 peak that continues on to, you know, even uh, higher wavelengths. But what we're doing is basically growing this from the side a little bit as much with, with water as well as we heat the planet. But you can notice here methane, N2O, ozone, and chlorofluorocarbons. These are all uh, things that human activities are changing. And here we're talking about ozone in the troposphere produced by photochemical smog. So here's records of all these gases except ozone, which is too reactive to preserve in glacial ice. But the other gases, these are the ice core records, just like the CO2, and we see the same thing increasing since the start of the Industrial Revolution and sometime in the post-World War II period really kicking up its rate. Now here's the important thing, even though there's a lot less of these gases in the atmosphere, they're much better at absorbing greenhouse radiation. So pound for pound, molecule for molecule, however you want to think about it, methane can absorb about 20 times as much IR as CO2, N2O about 300 times, and chlorofluorocarbons about 10,000 times. So you don't need to add very much of it to the atmosphere to have a change. And I will note, and I've noted for many, many years when I talk about this uh, in classes, is that pretty much no one until maybe the last few years has even considered these gases. So all the discussion about global treaties and limiting greenhouse gas emissions and everything else are focused on carbon dioxide, which is about half the problem, right? So even if we stop carbon dioxide production in the atmosphere, if we don't address these things, then we're not really addressing the full problem. And, and you can think about where does this come from? Primarily agricultural output, the use of natural gas, the mining of petroleum. Where does this come from? Perturbations to the nitrogen cycle, primarily over fertilization uh, in terrestrial environments. Where does this come from? It comes from things like air conditioners, propellants, cleaners, fire retardants, et cetera, et cetera. And these are topics that we talk about a lot in the environmental geochemicals. So the other thing you say, well, how long does, what is the kind of resonance time or lifetime of a gas in the atmosphere? So the atmosphere is really different than other parts of the um, exogenic uh, part of Earth in the sense that um, there's a lot of energetic light. The higher up you go in the atmosphere, the more energetic it is. And it causes a kind of chemistry called photochemistry, which um, 
makes molecules react, break apart and react in a slightly different way than they happen um, in the absence of photochemistry. And um, depending on where you are in the atmosphere, the light becomes more and more energetic. And some molecules that we stick in break down very, very quickly, or they transform into something else in those conditions. So for instance, for carbon dioxide, it's actually pretty hard to predict. It depends on the form and the location, but um, its lifetime is measured in years, years, decades, something like that. N2O lasts a pretty long time. It makes it all the way through the troposphere into the stratosphere. What distinguishes the stratosphere from the troposphere is at the base of the stratosphere, we have the ozone layer. The ozone layer absorbs a lot of this very energetic light, which makes the surface of the earth habitable for humans and all sorts of other organisms that don't live in water. And so in general, in the troposphere, gases can stay around a lot longer because there isn't this very energetic light. But if a gas can make it through the ozone layer up into the stratosphere where the light is less filtered, that's, that already tells you something about its relative stability. And so both uh, N2O and chlorofluorocarbons are destroyed in the stratosphere on a time scale of kind of like a eh, half century to a century. So even if you shut them off, they're still going to last for quite some time. Methane has a shorter half-life. Okay? Methane, when it reacts in the atmosphere, mostly, not entirely, but mostly reacts to make carbon dioxide, which then has a longer half-life. And so, um, you know, something that we could be addressing is, you know, cutting off the methane contribution, which is, you know, a much bigger greenhouse gas absorber than CO2. But it's turning this down is going to help affect the climate, but what this turns into is CO2, which then lasts longer. Some of these other gases are, are not important for this discussion, so I'm not gonna, not gonna go into them. So you can also say, well, so, um, you know, why, is, uh, why do we focus on CO2? Part of it is because it's the, um, the single biggest fraction and it's the first thing that people made observations of. And so this is just some charts, right? And these charts change, you know, every decade, every year, um, there's slight variations. But this is just, some of these are kind of synoptic overviews. The numbers don't change by a huge amount. Like for instance, the carbon dioxide budget in the atmosphere that humans are adding, um, this is sort of how it breaks down. Something like three quarters of it comes from fossil fuel combustion. There's another couple of percent that comes from the production of, of cement. Um, and then there's the effect of deforestation, right? By taking biomass out of the terrestrial ecosystems, we're taking the ability to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere to make oxygen away, which leaves more CO2 in the atmosphere. So everything we're thinking about is balances. Look, there's fluxes in, there's fluxes out. And taking a lot of plants off the, of the surface of the continents is having a pretty significant effect. And this is how things broke down about 10 years ago, right? So that um, you can kind of, kind of see where, you know, here's where the US is. Um, this is, you know, the kind of, um, the European Union part of it anyway, and you know various other areas. And what, what I could tell you is that if you were to do a plot for today, and I have some plots that show you how this has changed over time, that this is the part that's growing, especially rapidly, especially China, India, and other parts of Southeast Asia. So, um, and this is you know another kind of look um, just within the United States of, of how CO2 is being driven by various things, right? So um, biomass burning, highway vehicles, coal burning, natural gas petroleum, right? It's a, it's a pretty diverse pie. There are lots of slices in there, the main point. Same thing for chlorofluorocarbons. There are various uses that are contributing to it. It, it shows that the, these things are pervasive in our society um, there isn't one single thing we can just say, okay, let's just stop doing that. There needs to be significant changes in um, a lot of these sectors. Okay, so um, we can think a little bit about what is the role of carbon cycle? How is the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle linked together? Remember the red field ratio uh, equation and we already talked about earlier in the semester, the significant perturbations that humans have done to the nitrogen cycle primarily by industrial scale agriculture, where we have more than doubled the fluxes of nitrogen in and out of terrestrial ecosystems, terrestrial aquatic ecosystems, and to a lesser extent, marine ecosystems. Having all that extra nitrogen cranks up the rate of carbon cycling, 
It also changes the balance of CO2 and methane that comes out of various parts of the terrestrial ecosystem. And it's very difficult to separate nitrogen from carbon in terms of because they both are co-linked in photosynthesis and respiration, um, we think about them together. Also remember that nitrogen in itself can be a greenhouse gas uh, in its oxidized forms, right? So the stuff we can think about are greenhouse gas content of the atmosphere, how that's changed by human activities, the rates of things like continental erosion and how that affects the carbon cycle. And, and we kind of talked about this already. And we also think about the albedo, right? This is a, a feedback mechanism. Albedo is how reflective Earth is. We talked um, several times this semester, including last time, about how visible light that hits the surface of the Earth, about two thirds of it is reflected back visible and about one third is reflected back as infrared. And the surface of the Earth, what is on it, changes the albedo depending on climate conditions. So for instance, forested uh, areas absorb light, uh, desert areas reflect light, areas with ice sheets reflect more light than areas where the ice is melted and it's liquid water. And there are various other considerations as well. So these are, like I say, feedbacks. As climate changes just naturally during our glacial and glacial cycles, what uh, exists on the surface of the earth and how it affects albedo also changes. Also, as our orbital parameters change, as we talked about last time, that also affects albedo. So there's a lot of stuff to calculate. But the one thing that, that has changed really rapidly due to uh, human industrialization, human population changes, human land use practices, and human energy consumption practices is the rate at which we're pumping gases into the atmosphere. Right? That's something that you, um, we're making happen very, very quickly. And so those are the kinds of things we want to talk about. And so this is the exogenic cycle between the 1860s, that kind of like when the Industrial Revolution really kicked in, and the 1980s, when people very first started really talking about climate change and what we might do as a planet to um, mitigate it. And if we had started in those days with what we knew, we wouldn't be having the conversation that we have before. Okay? So in that period of time, that kind of you know roughly century, 120 years, we'd already seen the carbon dioxide rise by 20%, right? It's about half of the amount of CO2 that we put into the atmosphere at that stage stayed in the atmosphere. And we'll talk about that mass balance in a second. Okay, but then if you look at well, how much fossil fuel had we burned? We'd only burned about 0.3% of the total, right? So even though the type of fossil fuel that is available has become more expensive, more dispersed, deeper to find, High, lower in quality, et cetera, et cetera. There's still plenty of this, right? We're not going to run out of it. So it was a time when people said, oh, well, we'll just wait till we run out. It's like, never going to happen, right? Not in our lifetimes, not in our grandchildren's lifetimes. We can keep doing this unless we change, change our practices. So the other question is, where's the other part of this, right? And the other part goes into various reservoirs on various timescales. And again, we talked about this last time. The two fastest timescales um, two fastest reservoirs, I should say, um, with significant quantities of ability to absorb CO2 are the terrestrial plant biomass and the surface ocean. Okay? And for the surface oceans, it's a matter of dissolving into the water and then being incorporated into biomass in the form of phytoplankton. And if we, in this day and age, back in the 1980s, when we went and looked, it was hard to quantify these things, right? You couldn't just say, oh, yeah. The, you know, seawater's changed um, measurably because a lot of like mixing and natural variation, uh, mixing with surface water and deeper waters. And um, people could make some estimates about how much land was covered by forest. But when you get down to the level of how much carbon is in a tree, it's way more complicated. And so um, we'll, we'll look at this in a moment. But we, well, like I say, we know that about half of the CO2 we put into the atmosphere stayed, and the other half went into some combination of this. And our understanding of that has gotten a lot better. So these were the kind of fluxes in around 1980 or so. Um, this is a slightly later plot from um, you know, a book in um, 2001. So it's like, I call it Y2K fluxes, right? So. Um, you know, something like three gigatons of carbon were being added per year. And as I mentioned, just the US contribution now is closer to five, and the global contribution is something like, um, I don't know the exact number, but uh, we contribute less than 10, so maybe 15 years. Ago. 
So this was a change of about three gigatons per year starting back in 1860, right? And it's shown in a couple of different ways, right? Here's the three coming in per year, um, about half stayed in the atmosphere. And people were estimating that, you know, a little bit less than a quarter going into the terrestrial biosphere and a little bit more than a quarter going into the oceans. And this is just like another flux model uh, that kind of shows you how that transition was happening. And um, that gives you an idea of the rates at which, the, why the rates of these exchanges are so important, because as we're loading carbon to the atmosphere, if these rates were fast, it would just go here. Right, these reservoirs are way bigger than the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. If you look back to some of those slides that we talked about last time, we look at the sizes of the reservoirs. We'll look again in a moment at them. But um, the amount of carbon that's stored in these two places is much, much larger. For instance, there are 65 times as much carbon in seawater as bicarbonate as there is carbon in the atmosphere CO2. The problem is that it just doesn't go in there fast enough. Okay. And so this is um, a, a reservoir map showing you surface exogenic reservoirs and sort of how much carbon they have, right? And so you can see here, you know, the uh, reservoir, relative reservoir sizes um, corrected for rates of exchange. And um, so these are fluxes in essence. And you can kind of see how much is here, how much is here, how much is in the deep ocean, obviously much, much more. Um, we're only showing surface sediments in this particular diagram, but if you can include all sediments, it would be much larger than this even. Um, but in a practical sense, on kind of a decadal time scale, this is sort of why and how stuff breaks down uh, in terms of uh, fluxes and additions. Okay. So what we can kind of conclude is, is that the system is very out of equilibrium now. We're putting more CO2 into the atmosphere than can be redeposited in these other reservoirs. And it kind of just becomes a question of, well, how long does it take? What's the time scale for all of this? And so if you make the presumption that the 1860 system is closer to equilibrium, right? That's a, that's a guess. It could have already been out of equilibrium at that stage, but not very far. Then, then the modern system is far out of equilibrium, right? And as we add more, it becomes more out of equilibrium, which means that these rates are also changing, right? We can't assume that the rates of carbon exchange over the last century will apply in the future because we've started to saturate systems and um, change how they operate, right? Just think about changing the temperature profile on the planet, warming seawater changes the solubility of carbon and its ability to, to pull it out of the atmosphere as one example. So people talk about, um, they don't use this term so much anymore, but when I was learning this stuff, people always would talk about the the known and the unknown or the known and the missing carbon. And that was just this distinction between how much carbon was in the atmosphere relative to what we put in and how much wasn't known, right? That 50%-ish that now we know is in the terrestrial biosphere and the, the surface ocean. So I want to bring this out as an aside. This is a really interesting book if you're ever um, looking for a pretty good read. This is a guy who was a climate scientist for many, many years, and then he retired and you know, started writing books. And this is a book that explains how kind of human activities starting um, you know, with the kind of early days of the advent of agriculture you know, at the end of the last ice age, at the initiation of the Holocene, how human society, how war, how plague, and all that kind of stuff, as well as petroleum usage, affect carbon dioxide. In the and he makes a pretty compelling case that humans started changing the atmosphere when we started doing extensive agriculture, maybe 8,000 years ago. Think about like rice paddies. Think about you know starting to have a lot of cows. There's a lot of methane that comes out of that, and it affects the atmosphere, but not in the same level that the atmosphere is affected when we're burning petroleum. So it's a matter of thinking about scale. He also points out that there have been serious times in the past where there have been plagues, and or major changes in human population due to, for instance, the Europeans first coming to North America, that large scale changes in human population, especially reductions, causes reforestation. And that reforestation starts to pull down atmospheric gases. And so we get an idea at a big scale how um, much change we might expect to see. And so this is a reconstruction of um, 
is sort of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And he and many other people actually argue that you know, 10,000 years ago, which is roughly the start of the um, Holocene, which was about 15,000 years after the peak of the last ice age. Okay, last ice age peaked what we call the LGM about 25,000 years ago. Um, and people argue about that exact number, I think it was 24. Um, but in any event, if you look back in this glacial interglacial record, you will see that most ice ages last, eh, you know, the peak of them 10,000 years, maybe 15,000 years, right? So you come up, you go back down. We should, um, you know, have been out of, out of that ice age. And then the warm periods that ensue after them have a peak, which then starts to slowly cool back down into that ice age. And that peak also maybe only lasts about 10,000 years. In which case, if, if humans weren't doing what they're doing, we should probably be out of the peak of our of the current interpolation, right? And the argument is that human activities are making this into a longer, more extensive interglacial, plus we're going to push it to even higher temperature. But so this is part of that argument that you can kind of see CO2 coming down off of the peak at 10,000 years ago, then all of a sudden starting to kick up again. This is not driven by climate. This is not driven by the Milankovitch cycles we talked about last time. It's um, something else. And his argument, right, is, is that it's the advent of agriculture, right? So things start to kick up. And this is, doesn't really even include the anthropogenic forcing. And he, if you go, if you read the book, he gives you all sorts of, you know, discussions about, um, you know, what the various sources might be and how they're distributed on the planet. Um, I, you know, I'm not really doing justice to this conversation, but, but the key point is that this small change in CO2, right, you can look at the scale here. And if you recall, I said that at the start of the Industrial Revolution, 1780, 1790, we started about a value of 285, right? So this kind of change over the millennia due to like, you know, human age activities, Bronze Age, uh, agriculture, you know, society and everything else, up until the mid or to late 1700s, maybe kick this thing up by you know 10 or 20 units, right? And now I just I showed you that plot. This is where 419 this year, right? So that's completely off scale on this thing, right? That's hundreds. This is tens. So it's just important to recognize the differences in the scale because there are people who take this information and say, oh no, well we've been changing it for 8,000 years. Why bother doing something about it now? But we can measure the change, but it was small. Right, compared to the big change that we have. Okay, so we can think about um, how these reservoirs may have changed relative to the past. And so, for instance, uh, in 1860, and the units used on this diagram, we think the atmosphere was 600. This is another one of these sort of Y2K-ish plots. Um, these values have changed. Um, they've grown significantly in the atmosphere as we've started to saturate these other systems' as ability to absorb things out. And um, to estimate the time scales, which you know we'll look at an estimate of those in a second from one of these IPCC reports, but people look at the CO2 uh, in the atmosphere as recorded by various proxies as well as direct measurements. They look at the rate at which it's been put in, and they look at um, you know this this uh, balance, this so-called balance. And so over most of that time, like I say, about half went into um, these other reservoirs. And so this is an example of how the oceans absorb things. And you have to think about the oceanic circuit, the circulation patterns, the difference between shallow water and deep water and all that kind of stuff um, to kind of get an understanding of why the oceans don't act as a huge reservoir on short time scales. Because the only part of the atmosphere that can really exchange are the shallow, is the shallow water part, right? And shallow water part's about the top 100 meters. So this is like a simple-minded calculation. If we say the top 100 meters of the ocean is 100% effective at absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere, right? Then it acts like you know 100 meters equivalent of ocean water volume. The deep water masses are probably only two and a half percent effective. And where does this come from? This comes from calculating on a volume basis the rate at which the oceans circulate that deep ocean conveyor belt, the 1500 year time scale, integrating that across this flow path. And then the mid water is basically a mixing zone between them. And so if you add effectiveness efficiencies to them, you see that the oceans act like they're only about 400 meters deep in terms of ability to absorb CO2, not 4,000 meters. 
60. That cuts down their ability by a factor of 10. So before I said, oh yeah, you know, the 65 times as much CO2 dissolved in the oceans and the atmosphere. It's like, yeah, it is. But over the time scale where the ocean can absorb stuff from the atmosphere, it's, it's only a tenth of that because of this effect, right? So that makes a differential a lot less, right? It's, it's easy enough to start to saturate this upper level and keep all of this lower stuff, which hasn't been exposed to the atmosphere yet. And for most of it won't be exposed for another thousand years or so, um, it's out of equilibrium. So this is a slight look at um, terrestrial ecosystems and their carbon storage as well. And um, you know, this is basically a diagram calculating net fluxes. Again, this is like one of these Y2K diagrams. Um, and so um, you know, these numbers continue along these trends. You can see this is the net amount of carbon going into the atmosphere because of deforestation specifically, right? And so um, and it's divided up into sort of tropical and temperate, and here's the total. And it's not that tropical uh, watersheds contain more carbon, it's that humans had more effectively deforested the temperate regions earlier on in our history. I think about what Europe must have been before it was populated. Think about what we know North America was before the Europeans came, South America, all these other places. Uh, in the temperate regions, they were largely already deforested. So we don't see as much effect. But you can see the net effect of just deforesting. This is just a diagram showing you what countries are doing what with tropical rainforests. And um, it isn't evenly distributed around the globe. And there are other reasons to want to preserve tropical rainforests besides the carbon load, but um, it's a gigantic effect, right? On something that represents about a quarter in a net sense of the total flux of carbon from the atmosphere, um, you know, it's being impacted by deforestation. It gets harder and harder to put carbon in land plants if there's less land plants. Okay, so this is a plot again, a kind of historical, it came out in Scientific American in 2001, right? And there's two things on here, the CO2 record, which we've already talked about, right? And at this stage, it was only up to 360. Remember now we're up here at about 4, 420, okay? on this scale. There's also a temperature re reconstruction, right? And so the temperature reconstruction is in red and uh, pink is the uncertainty in it. If we go farther and farther back, you know, thermometers weren't so good in the old days, there weren't so many measurements all around the planet, there's more uncertainty in the temperature, right? And that's, this goes into the models and the reconstructions and the trying to understand the climate change. But what we can see and what we knew by the start of the century is that temperature had already increased along with carbon dioxide to a place that was higher than any time in the preceding thousand years, right? We knew that, 100% certain. And um, this is the sort of average temperature in 1998, just as an example. And I'm gonna show you more recent plots where this data is now un unequivocal, right? I mean, we're now way beyond that. We can say that the temperature has been hotter now for any time in hundreds of thousands of years. But as I say, and as I think everyone appreciates, as you go farther back in time, it's harder to get temperature records. We use proxies, right? And I mentioned one of them last time, which is the strontium calcium ratio in corals growing in shallow seawater. You can say something about the temperature in that particular location. You can look at stuff like uh, the assemblage of pollens that you find in a terrestrial sediment and how, uh, or soil and how you know, pollen reflects um, what trees were growing at the time. And we know trees somehow reflect climate. So there are ways of reconstructing temperature, but as I say, it does get more and more imprecise, especially as we go back to the period before we had any kind of thermometer. But there's a direct correlation here. And this was, like I say, this was settled science around the turn of the century. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you some more data and they come from these various things called IPCC reports. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's a UN thing. Started back, uh, I believe it was in the 80s. It might have been the early 90s, but they do a report every five to seven years. And it's basically a bunch of scientists. There's no politics involved in um, you know, these um, scientific data reports. They're always, when they're published, there's also maybe within a year, kind of more of a policy report. You can go on the web, I've given you the, the address. And um, there has just been another report uh, that came out um, last year 
But um, one of the things I like to do is look back at the retrospective reports, see how they've changed, see how things compare. And so this was the report in 2007, okay? Um, end of the Bush presidency before uh, Obama came. And so this is kind of an update to that prior plot, right? This plot came out in, two, excuse me, in 2001. This is like um, uh, six years later. This is global mean temperature, again, with some uncertainty. And this is global average sea level. And this is Northern hemisphere snow cover, something that you can kind of detect with satellite images. And you can see that um, some of them are changing more obviously than others. Like, you know, within the uncertainty, maybe this hasn't changed at this time. This has changed now, uh, but this was obviously changing, right? This is obviously changing. And what, what climate modelers look at is not the absolute value, but the deviation relative to some prior mean that we think was natural forcing. We know that a lot of these processes have natural cycling that causes them to go up and down for various reasons and different time scales. And what we're really looking at is how much change is happening beyond what can be accounted for naturally, it therefore must be from human activity. Okay. And so um, this is just sort of a summary. And this is a diagram I showed you last time, if you recall, back in the Cretaceous and going back into the Jurassic when we didn't have a landmass over the Southern Hemisphere, when the, plant, when the continents were arranged very differently on the planet, we had a very hot planet, very high CO2 in the atmosphere. And this is what um, you know, global temperature reconstructions look like. And as we come into the Paleogene and we move forward in time, especially in the Quaternary, we start to develop more of these climate swings, which are re responses to um, the Milankovitch forcing. So you can say, all right, um, when was the last time that the carbon dioxide was as high as it is today? And I haven't updated this slide in a few years. So here I have it 412, obviously now it's 419. But you have to go back to this peak here, okay? This period of time, back when we didn't have the extensive um, you know, climate forcing coming from Milankovitch cycling, at least it wasn't affecting us like that. And we're not that far from being back to these kinds of concentrations doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to go to these conditions, because these conditions weren't only a reflection of CO2 in the atmosphere. They were a reflection of how do the oceans operate? How do they circulate? How does the biosphere work, uh, both the terrestrial and the marine? And so this is you know, part, of, part of why people question where we're, where we're exactly headed. But um, what we can say is that when the CO2 was here, the temperature on the planet average global mean was about six degrees warmer. If you recall, I also said last time that what really changes during these glacial interglacial cycles more recently is the gradients of temperature between the equator and the poles. Most of the warming and cooling happens up near the poles. So the poles are much more sensitive and the poles have a major role in driving things like our albedo because of ice cover, yes or no, because of you know, emissions of various gases like methane from tundra and per uh, permafrost regions that then freeze out and those kinds of things. And so a small change globally can still be a relatively big change up at the pole. A six degree average change would be huge because it would probably mean something more like 12 degrees of change at the poles, a completely ice-free northern hemisphere and a significantly ice-free um, southern hemisphere. Right, so that's, that would change sea level, obviously, by the way. Okay, so, you know, people back, as I say, by the time of the turn of the century, we're already starting to say, well, what's going to happen due to anthropogenic effects? And this is one effect um, from your reading, which is basically looking at how the climate swings started. This was the last natural interglacial 125,000 years ago when uh, uh, Waimanala formation here on Oahu, the Eva Plain deposited the coral reef. Then we went back down in the last ice age. As we talked about last time, it's kind of slow, but the peak of the glacial maximum was here. We came out quickly. And if it weren't for anthropogenic effects, that ice age would probably, you know, have, or excuse me, this interglacial would have, the peak of it would have ended and would be kind of equivalent to this, kind of coming back in, except for the fact that human activities are perturbing things. And so in this instance, the argument was, well, it's just going to make it a more intense interglacial than it normally would have been. 
but that all of the climate forcing, which has been operating for a million uh, years or so, would pull us back down eventually. And it's a possibility. The question is, is when, right? That competing with that is the fact that we've now taken CO2 to a place where the system doesn't work like that anymore, right? So we don't actually know that we're in a kind of super interglacial scenario and headed for an ice age or not because we've pulled it so far out of equilibrium. And this is where models are really helpful because they can tell us a lot about the possibilities. So this is just another plot. This is from that uh, Rudderman book that I mentioned, sort of looking at just, this is coming off the last ice age, looking at global temperature and um, what it might look like, um, you know, just naturally, right, coming off the, um, the uh, interglacial and going back slowly towards an ice age and how human activity might be. And this is, you know, this is somewhat theoretical. That's why there's kind of no scale over here. There is probably some threshold at which where you say, well, if we have so much uh, gas to the atmosphere that, um, you know, we exceed the threshold of being able to have significant glaciation, then will we continue? Will we get a really big spike that comes back down? How long will that last? Um, or are we putting ourselves into a situation where we're not going to be able to have glaciation, at least until that carbon recovers? So then it becomes a question of how long is it going to take for the carbon to recover? If you recall, I showed you a diagram last time that said, you know, if you put a pulse of carbon into the atmosphere and you wait several thousand years, most of it will then become dissolved in the oceans or added to the terrestrial biosphere. And so that's kind of the time scale we're thinking of here, whether it's 1,000 years or two or five, we don't really know. But um, at some point, the system should probably recover. Right? So, but now let's think about it kind of more immediately. So this is, again, from that scientific, uh, you know, American article Actually, no, this is IPCC, since I, I apologize, but from the same time as, as that. So this is a, an earlier report. This is looking at temperature observations um, since the mid-1800s in red, and a model is in gray. And so even based on that knowledge at the start of the century, basically, you get the best fit from the models when you include both anthropogenic forcing, meaning our addition of greenhouse gases, and all the natural things that we think affect climate. Both of these things are worse fits than the combined, right? And so you can see here that the, the gray and the red match pretty well. And uh, which means that as of this time, within you know, some amount of uncertainty, um, that we're able to model, best model the observations by including anthropogenic forces. Okay, so now this jumps ahead. Uh, this is the 2007 report again. And now this is looking at several things, the observations and the predictions for um, the whole globe, the land areas of the globe, the ocean areas of the globe. And it's pretty clear that, so the, the pink is the kind of anthropogenic plus natural forcing, the blue is just natural forcing. You can kind of see where this is headed, right? And we're getting better at making those predictions. And this is how those predictions in 2007 looked for the different continental land masses, right? Some of them showing more obvious change than others, but every continent showing for the last 20 to 30 years of the 20th century, a deviation, you know, the pink not overlapping with the blue, right? That natural forcing could not explain climate anymore. So this is a graphic that just shows you temperature anomalies, and it goes year by year by year. You're looking down on the North Pole, and right, and so, it's one thing to look at global averages, another to look at regions. And these are anomalies relative to the mean in 1950, okay? And so what you saw there is, is that, you know, I can, I can play it again for you, but um, most of the area, right? So blue is colder and red is warmer. And as we progress through, it doesn't become, you know, obvious that every place turns red or whatever. There's still some places that are cooler and warmer on a yearly basis, but we start to get deeper tones of red and more coverage of red. So that by the time we're at the end here in 2021, everywhere is hotter, right? So you can look down here at the scale. This is five degrees hotter than it was beforehand. These are not like small, small effects. These are big effects. You know, even over most of this area, we're talking about a couple of degrees. And I've given you this, this came from this guy. He has like a climate Twitter and he has all sorts of 
you know, cool graphics and stuff uh, on his website. So this is some other data um, that um, from you know IPC report. This is the 2013 report. So the one after the 20, uh, 2007 we've been talking about. So here we've got land surface air temperature, four data sets, sea surface temperature, five different data sets. That's what the different colors are. Um, marine air temperature, sea level, summer Arctic sea ice cover. I'm not going to read each one of these things, you know, humidity, their temperature content. I think you can see that pretty much all of them are going up, right? There's overlap between the data sets, you know, except for, you know, anything that has to do with glacial mass balance or uh, ice going, going down. But there's lots of indicators besides temperature itself. Okay, so now let's go back to the gases again. Okay, so this is a 2007 report, and you can basically see this is the carbon dioxide, this is the methane, this is the nitrous oxide, the gases I've, I've talked to you about. And you can really get a feeling for the magnitude of change recently, right? So this is starting, you know, 10,000 years ago and moving forward. And so you can kind of see the natural variations were coming out the ice age and things are starting to warm up a little bit. Um, with plus or minus some of that uh, human forcing from agriculture that Rutherman talked about, but that this is this is what you know humans have done in the last couple hundred years, right? It's just uh, hopefully that's that's pretty dramatic for you. This shows you what this looks like on a smaller, you know, more compressed scale. Okay, so adding those gases to the atmosphere is complicated. They don't just warm things up. And I'm going to try to go through this table, but you can see CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, CFCs. Etc. and all the stuff that they do in the atmosphere. So there's a column about greenhouse gases, but there's also other changes that happen to the atmosphere because we're adding these gases along with other gases as well that affect the lifetimes and distributions of those gases and their ability to store heat. Plus there are you know, other uh, you know, impacts um, that affect things like, you know, the rate of carbon cycling between terrestrial and aquatic, uh, ecosystems in the atmosphere that are also affected by uh, some of these gases. Um, but the net effect is that we're adding stuff to the atmosphere, it's changing its temperature content, and climate is changing. Now, it turns out that that's not the only thing we're doing to the atmosphere. Right? Think about, you know, every time you ride behind a bus, you see all that black smoke coming out of it. I mean, it's getting better because we have, you know, more electric buses now. I think that every time you fly an airplane, you know, in the stratosphere and you put little ice particles in there. There are lots of things that we do that put particulates in the atmosphere. Some of them absorb, some of them reflect as an example. And so this is a plot, again, from the 2007 report. It tries to look at the forcing in terms of heat content of all of these various parameters. So here's the greenhouse gases, how much heating we get from these various sources, right? So you can see here, at this time in 2007, if you looked at the CO2 relative to the other gases, this estimate was saying, you know, before I told you these were roughly equal, in this particular estimate, they were putting CO2 at something like, this is maybe like two thirds, one thirds, but whatever the exact number is, um, that's how that breaks out. This is how changing ozone um, in the stratosphere and then the troposphere, which is something related to human activities. This is chlorofluorocarbon use, and this is primarily photochemical smog from automobile exhaust, you know, changing water vapor by emitting um, methane into the stratosphere, primarily through uh, you know, intercontinental plane flights. Uh, and then stuff like uh, how we're changing the reflectivity of the earth by land use changes, by starting to have soot showing up in areas where there's snow, which changes its heat absorption, uh, by adding aerosols to the atmosphere, which cool the planet because they're reflecting, they're adding to the albedo. Um, and so, and then calculating kind of a total net effect. This is basically the heat absorbing capability of that. And this is the net effect. And so this is in forcing units, meaning the heat content uh, aspect that drives warming. And so you can see here that there's a pretty significant change with a pretty significant uncertainty relative to the past. And this, these values can be compared to the changes in this value, watts per meter squared, over most of um, you know, the quaternary where we're able to uh, use Milankovitch cycle. Okay. And this is just like a little bit more information from uh, you know, the next report after that, the 2013 report, 
it kind of summarizes how each one of these factors contributes to warming. It isn't just CO2, it's these things working together and how they affect the heat balance from that reflection of you know, visible wavelengths turning into infrared uh, wavelengths and then reflecting back off the planet. Okay, so now if we look at some models, and these are you know relatively early models, these are 2001 IPC synthesis models. These are model predictions of different scenarios of putting CO2 into the atmosphere, right? And so, you know, as early as the early 1990s, people were saying, okay, what if we did this with CO2? Or what if we did that with CO2, right? And even to this day, people talk about, and it's, it's pretty much a pipe dream, but can you reduce CO2 emissions back to the 1990 levels? Those are always the lowest values that you see on these diagrams. We're never going to get there. Well, I don't think we'll even get back to reducing to the year 2000 values, right? And we've significantly changed since the year 2000. Since we already knew all this stuff, we've been continuing to pump more and more CO2 in the atmosphere. But the key thing here is look at the numbers in gigatons. Remember, from the start of the Industrial Revolution till about maybe the year 1980 or 1990, six gigatons per year, right? And now we're looking at some scenarios, 20 gigatons per year, right? That's like more than a factor of three on top of that. This is the net effect on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Remember the pre-industrial revolution value, 285, the current value, 420. Look at some of these values. These are model predictions. Even if we cap our CO2 at 1990s level, it's still gonna go up for a little while, right? So this was in um, 2001. We thought maybe it'll flatten out around 2050 or 60 and then just continue on. Why does it continue on? Because of those exchanges. They're too slow to pull the CO2 back out. But as I say, we're never going to get back to this yellow line, at least not, not in our life. Um, we might get to the green line. And, and as I say, you know, the details of what these models are and the scenarios and how much CO2 is being produced and by what countries and in what form. And, um, and again, it doesn't even include the methane or the N2O or the ozone, which is part of global warming. But you can see the predicted global temperature change associated with each of these models, right? And you know, up here we've got five degrees. Think back to that chart I showed you a while ago. At five degrees C higher temperature, we don't have you know ice on anywhere on the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, ice is significantly reduced. Okay, so um, this is you know the 2013 synthesis. These are just some more models. Um, and like I say, they show you carbon in the atmosphere, um, kind of, um, it, it, or actually, excuse me, carbon in the atmosphere. This is chlorofluorocarbons. This is methane. This is nitrous oxide. So, you know, they're giving you a little bit more information. And again, various scenarios for how much we do or don't control them, right? And so you can look at the kind of range here, the best case scenario, which is going back to these 1990 guys, takes us to um, something like 50% more than the pre-industrial value. The worst case scenario takes us like you know, eight times. So then you can say, all right, um, you know, what this is now an even later IPCC report, this is the one from, you know, uh, they, they don't come out all at one time, they kind of bleed them out. And so I, I downloaded this in April of 2022, earlier this year. So this is looking now at how these gases have actually changed. GHG is just greenhouse gas emissions. And so you, we can look at here's CO2 increasing um, and, uh, and another calculation, the orange bar is how much additional CO2 is coming from land use changes. We've got the methane, we've got the nitrous oxide, we've got the CFC, and you can see that they're also going up, right? So for 20, 22 years since that 2001 synthesis, where we had already knew about the, you know, the temperature change being definitive and we can make predictions about all these things. These numbers keep just keep going up, right? They're not going down. They're going up. This is um, some you know, estimates from the 2013 report about how much you know, temperature uh, or gene CO2 variations are going to go for different uh, loading scenarios. And um, you know where we are relative to that, right? Again, we're sort of right here, right? And so part of the reason of looking back at these older reports is to say, well, okay, here's where we were, here's the observations, you know, going up through here, and where are we now? We're sort of here. We can kind of figure out where we actually are relative to all these various models, right? That say, oh, what if we do this? What if we do that? 
or maybe not mild, we call them scenarios. We're kind of shooting up the middle, right? We're not down here at the bottom end where we need to be. We're not up here at the top end, which would be the most doomsday, but we're kind of shooting up the middle. And again, here's some uh, the other gases. This is now 2013. So in the 2007 report, they kind of focused on CO2. And by the 2013 report, they started to include some of the other gases. And you can kind of see you know, where we're headed in terms of concentrations. And I always go back to the CO2 one because that's the easiest one to remember that we're at kind of 420 you know, we're somewhere in here and we're shooting up the middle still of those models. Okay. Um, and this is basically the corresponding temperature variation predicted. And again, you just say we're, these are different uh, temperature data sets. There's a lot of variability to it on an annual basis, but we're kind of shooting up the middle and you can kind of see, you know, what we might be expecting. And um, these are the associated sea level changes. And again, we're kind of shooting up the middle. And so you can kind of see what's expected. These are, you know, sea level rises mean over the entire planet. They don't uh, rise and fall the same in different places. And it's from a rather complicated set of reasons. But um, in any event, these are measurables. These are predictables. They're happening. We know they're happening. So you can make some projections, and these are projections. This is from the uh, 2007 report. And basically, you can say, all right, for two different scenarios, um, what do we, or for, excuse me, for various scenarios, which are all these different curves, for do two different time periods, one, 2020 to 2029, which you know now we're in this scenario, right? But when this report was written, that seemed like the future. Right? That was 10 years into the future. And this is kind of the end of the century. Okay. And this is um, probabilities, right? So these are bell curves for different scenarios of loading and different ways of kind of running the models for some of the uncertainties of what do we think the actual variations will be, right? And probably somewhere along the bell curve, maybe not right at the peak, you know, there are uncertainties and there's variations here, but we're looking at the end of the century, a global mean temperature change of something like you know three and a half or four degrees as global that means the poles are going to change by something like three times that of 10 right and um so these are um maps of temperature distribution around the planet and so this is the kind of most conservative carbon loading something up the middle like we've been doing and this is the most extreme and so i think you know we, we we recognize that we're probably never going to be able to follow this. It's too hard for humans. Um, hopefully, we won't go along this path. Maybe we're going to shoot along this. And you can see that even in this scenario, where the global means maybe something like three degrees at the end of the century, you can go up here to the northern hemisphere and you can already see it's like you know six and a half, seven, seven and a half degrees. Right? That's just, this is why we say that the Arctic is going to change by a lot. There's also projections and precipitation changes. So, you know, I always look at like, oh, what does Hawaii look like in these models? And so you can kind of see what we look like. And um, we don't expect a lot of temperature variation, right, because of this fact that we're close to the equator, right? And our temperatures are already modulated by the surface oceans, which are a big thermal mass and pretty hard to heat up by you know, more than a very small amount, even if the air temperature changes. And you can see that, you know, in essence, we're expected to maybe get a little bit drier here. The impacts in Hawaii are not that great. But if you look elsewhere on, you know, on the planet, you can see lots of impacts. I, this is kind of like a quaint old timey map uh, from a, you know, a textbook. This is like a late 1990s, early, uh, I don't think it's, it's year 2000. I, I don't have the date for this, but um, it's from one of the older textbooks on my shelves. And this is just a map showing you here are all the places in North America were, where they were already by that time seeing more intense and more frequent weather events, right? Just kind of looking at compared to historical records. And, you know, you don't have to watch um, your favorite news report, um, you know, whatever channel you like and whatever, when they talk about kind of trends across the whole nation to know that there are many times a year now where people talk about extreme events, right? the hottest, the driest, the coldest, the whatever. Um, and that's because we're putting more energy in the atmosphere. Like more energy into the atmosphere, it um, behaves more turbulently and we get bigger extremes. And this was, like I say, something that was already known by the turn of the century. 
There's other kind of predictions people can make too, um, such as biosphere impacts. And this is just kind of one example, um, which is, you know, you maybe remember this from some um, biology class that in addition to these kind of latitudinal biome zones when you go from the equator up to the temperate regions, up to the um, high latitudes, that those are kind of mimicked when you go up a mountain. So if you go up like a high mountain at the equator, you go through all the various climate zones and you can get to kind of you know, Arctic or tundra-like conditions if you go high enough. And people can look at how has that changed. Like go to a city like Denver or Mexico City or Quito, Ecuador, or you know, look at the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro and see how things have changed. And one of the most sensitive indicators is the presence or absence of mosquito-borne disease. Mosquitoes don't thrive as well, uh, especially in terms of um, you know, disease-carrying mosquitoes in places that freeze for a significant part of the year. But as they start to warm up and mosquitoes can last all year, meaning they don't die out in the winter, then you can start to pass along more mosquito-borne diseases, whether it's malaria or West Nile virus or what have you. And so that, um, again, this was from that Scientific American article in the year 2000. These were already being observed, right? This is 22 years ago. And they're only become more and more evidence for these. So I think part of the conversation that people haven't put together yet, they don't like to be doom and gloom, but the changes that we're imparting to the atmosphere are not just going to make weather more extreme, sea level rise, and make it hotter. They're also going to affect global human health right? Global food production, things that our society is based on. And so, uh, you know, expect those changes. So this is another diagram. This is from the 2013 report and tries to explain how and why we get kind of more intense and more frequent um, atmospheric variation events um, when we start to heat up the atmosphere. And so basically, you know, it looks at um, a variety of parameters and, and what you can see is, is that as we heat up the planet and um, the way the atmosphere circulates and the way weather systems correspond to kind of flow patterns and perturbations and flow patterns, is that we expect kind of more hot and more cold events. Right? So you think about these Arctic blasts that hit the northern part of the country sometimes a year because of the change in the way the uh, Gulf Stream is flowing across the, um, the continent. And, and so it's not just that it's going to get hotter. Sometimes it will be colder. Sometimes it will be hotter um, during the year and depending on your latitude. Some places it will be wetter. Some places it will be drier. Um, but this is all a function of changing the energetics of the atmosphere. Oh, and I thought I had one more slide. I guess I chopped it out. But so that's kind of a summary in a nutshell. Um, I hope I didn't go too quickly through all of that. Um, but this is, for me, it's been a big change, you know, I would say up until Al Gore's movie, which was whatever, around Y2K. I used to talk about this stuff with classes and they were like, what are you doing? That stuff's going on. Now everyone knows it's going on. But um, we require whole scale change to our habits as a kind of human society if we're going to you know, make these um, significant changes. And um, so it's incumbent on everyone. Well, so are, are there questions about this? Anything, any aspect of that? No, okay. <laughs>